bless the Lord. Thank you so much. Two little boys walking down the street in their city and they're bored. They decide they want some candy. They go into a convenience store and they pick up some candy and as they're on their way to the checkout place, they realize neither one of them have any money. Well, they decide that wanting the candy is more important than integrity, so they catch the owner of the store distracted and slip out. They go down the street, hide in an alley, and eat all the candy that they've bought. They begin to feel a little bad, partly because of all the candy they've eaten, partly because they feel guilty. What do we do about this, one boy said to the other? I don't know. They just happen to be right across the church from a church. And so the, one little boy, the eight-year-old, goes into the church that has confession booths. He slides into the confession booth. The pastor slips in beside him, looks down and sees this little eight-year-old boy, concerned about this little boy's understanding of God, simply says to him, son, where is God? Now, the little boy is already feeling guilty already, and so he says nothing. His eyes just get big. So the pastor assumes the little boy can't hear him and simply says, son, where is God? Again, the little boy says nothing. His eyes continue to grow larger. And finally, the pastor just thinks this little boy is deaf. So the, little boy, the pastor says to the little boy, Son, where is God? At that, the boy dashes out of the confession booth, out of the church, across the street, panting for breath, looks at the little boy, and the other little boy says, What happened? What happened? The eight-year-old says, They can't find God, and they're trying to blame us. Now, that's an old joke. Thank you for laughing like you've heard it for the first time. That was very nice. The Bible tells us that God displays himself in nature, that he wants to show himself to all the world that he is alive and well. The, 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 the beauties of our bodies, the way they're interacted and the way they co coordinate perfectly is evidence of God's presence. But so is the church. The church of Jesus Christ is evidence that God is alive and well. And so the world in which we are placed, we are the physical representative of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so the world around us watches us and how they see us uh, determines how they see God. Every time I say that, that scares me. And it should cause us to be concerned because we have a great responsibility in this world that needs a God desperately. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter is writing to a group of people that are out of their homes. They're on exile because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And he's writing to them to stand firm in the grace of Almighty God. He is encouraging them to stand firm in this glorious salvation that God's provided for them in chapter 1, verses 3 to 12, talking about that salvation that's secure, that is guarded, that is kept for them uh, permanently. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 1 down to chapter 2, verse 3, he talks to them about how to display the salvation, how to show that God's salvation is alive and well in them. Last week we talked about the first two commands. In fact, that whole section of Scripture beginning in verse 13, there are five commands that are there to talk to us about how to display our salvation before a world that needs Him. The first command is given to us in verse 13 that the uh, the command is to set your hope fully on the grace being brought to you through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The next command is given in verse, verse 16 where it says, and be holy, that is, be set apart for Almighty God. Today, Lord willing, we're going to cover the next three commands that God gives us in beginning in verse 17, that they were commanded to conduct themselves in fear. Verse 22 of chapter 1, they were, they were commanded to love one another. And finally, in chapter 2, verse 2, they were commanded to crave the pure spiritual milk of the Word. In essence, God is calling us to display our relationship with God, uh, to display, rather, our salvation before, my, uh, before God in our response to Him. That is, how we respond to God reveals either the absence or the presence of our salvation. I pray as we've walked away through these commands that, that, Peter, that God's given to us in 1 Peter, that it would cause each one of us to examine whether or not we really are followers of Jesus Christ. And secondly, how are people seeing Jesus in me? That if God's salvation really exists, 
then God should be obvious in our life. Now, here's the next two commands. Here is the main idea is simply this, that God's salvation is displayed in our lives and our response to God's judgment and our response to God's people and our response to God's word. The first command given to us, verses 17 to 21, God's salvation is displayed in our response to God's coming judgment. The command is given to us. He gives us four characteristics of God's judgment that he gives us there in verse, uh, the command given to verse 17, conduct yourselves in fear. That is, that, that sounds odd, but this command is, in fact, all three of these commands, in fact, all five of these commands are commands of urgency. Do it and do it now. Don't wait. Don't waste any time. Do it and do it now. A command of urgency. Conduct yourself is, a, is to conduct ourselves in fear. Now, now, the word that's translated fear there is the word we get our word phobia from. Phobia. Now, that, that sounds counter gospel that we would conduct ourselves in fear. That is, we are to conduct ourselves rather not in a cringing, stop action kind of fear, but a fear that is a fear of healthy respect, that there is one day that all of us will be held accountable for the way we lived our lives. Even though we stand firm in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the salvation that God's given to us uh, so we can have a living hope and inheritance he guards, we still understand that we will be held accountable one day. And Paul r- relates this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, same word for fear, the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest to your consciences also, that as we conduct ourselves in fear, knowing that God's judgment is coming. The scripture says in Hebrews, it's appointed to man once to die, and then comes judgment. There is coming an accountability time, even though we are secure in our salvation to God, the way we live our life is going to be held in account. In account. This judgment that's coming is, is, will be conducted as a God, as our Father. We enter into a family relationship with God through faith. We're going to stand before a holy God who we can call Abba, Father, by His grace. And Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says, For we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, that is a cringing stop action kind of fear, but we have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's, that's an Aramaic term of saying we call holy God, Daddy. Not flippantly, not arrogantly, but in a family relationship that he's made possible only through faith in Jesus Christ. We are stand before Dad to be held accountable. And we understand that we stand before him, we conduct ourselves in fear, knowing that accountability is coming. We stand before our Father, and we also understand that, God, that Dad's judgment is impartial. The word that's used there, impartiality, speaks of without respect of persons, without preference. It is, one man says, our knowledge of him as father must not dispel our dread of him as our judge. Karen Jobes in her commentary says, the pagan life that God abhors will no less be abhorred if it is lived by one who professes to be a Christian. The Christian who has been born again of the father must live, in fact, as a child of God. That is, we are to live differently because we are, we've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, which he details for us in verses 18 to 21. We stand before God. We conduct our lives in fear. Even though we stand before an impartial daddy, we stand before him with confidence, if you will, beginning in verse 18 to 21, knowing that is this knowing that we have, it's a, it's a knowledge that, that, was, that was begun when we, we chose to receive Christ that goes on to now. We know, what, what do we know? That we have been ransomed from the feudal way inherited from our forefathers. That is, we know without a doubt that we have been ransomed by God. That word ransom speaks of a past completed act. That is something that took place in the past is completed in, in, in the act. That ransom means that we are released from prison. That we are released from a condemning lifestyle. We are released from God's judgment. We are released from God's condemnation as it talks about in Romans 8 chapter 1. That is there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, now you say, now, Alan, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. We, we live in confidence. We live outside of God's condemnation. But then you're saying that we're to conduct ourselves in fear. That is, there is still accountability happening. Even though we're part of Dad's family because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we are still held accountable for the way we live life. And we do that out of respect. Do you remember your high school principal? Our high school principal was about seven, nine 
hair out of his ears. He was a scary, I think he had, he had nail, the fingernails that grew to about nine foot long. He was a scary guy. His, his name was Don Johnson from East Newton High School. He was huge. I mean, he could cause an eclipse just rocking into a room. You know, know that guy? And we, we had a healthy respect of him. Healthy respect. It caused breath to stop often when he walked into a room. When, you, when he walked into a place where you knew you'd been misbehaving, you immediately began to behave. Don Johnson. We had a healthy respect for Don Johnson because of his size, but also because of his authority. And back in that day, the principals could still bust you with a paddle. And he had a paddle that had red on the end of it, which rumor had it that there was dried blood from previous students. <laughs> no one checked it out to verify its legitimacy. We were afraid to check it. There was a healthy respect that's there because of Don Johnson. Therefore, because of the healthy respect of our principal, we knew that there were certain ways to act when we were in class. Because if we, dis if we misbehaved in class, we got to go enter into the human eclipse causer. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I are, are created by a holy God, saved by God's grace, and one day we will stand before a holy God that has that is holy, that in him there is no darkness, that in him there is light. And one day we will stand before him to give an account for the way we live life. Because we are his child, children, we are going to be giving an account for the way we have obeyed him and we'll be held accountable for the way we disobeyed him. We will not stand before him to determine where we will spend eternity because Jesus Christ in our lives guarantees that our eternity will be in heaven with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that. But what we will be held accountable for will be determine the kind of reward that we receive that we can cast at his feet. So we live our lives knowing that we will one day stand before a holy God that's there. Now, the second command that we give is, is verse 22, that we not only are to conduct ourselves in fear, but the second command is that we are to love one another, is that God's salvation is displayed in our response to God's people. Quite frankly, conducting ourselves in fear before a holy God is easier at times than loving God's people. I'll let that one sink in just a second. I've had the privilege of passing for 30 years. I loved it. I thank God for calling me to do that. But I got to tell you that, that some of the deepest wounds I have have come from God's people. There, there are times that ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the people involved. There are times that I wanted to lay hands on people that even Benny Hinn couldn't fix. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the command that God gives us is not up for option. It's not for up to... A, debate that the command he gives us again is an urgent command expected to take place that we are called to love one another this loving one another is a command to be obeyed it literally it's a command given to a group given to the group of those in asia minor and modern day turkey it's a command literally it's a you all love one another it's not just love him love her but love everyone that's connected to your church love you all love one another is what he's saying. It's a command that it calls to elevate others' needs above your own. Is That's the command that's there. It's the, you've heard the word agape, the agapao, that is, I love the way Jesus loved me, and that he gave himself so I could be forgiven of sin, and therefore the, the love I've, I've, been, I've experienced, I am to give, regardless of the circumstance. It, didn't just, it doesn't say love one another as long as everything is going well. It says love one another even over in Matthew, Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. In fact, Jesus says, anyone can love one another if they're treating you right. But loving one another that are persecuting you, that's the only possible because of Jesus' presence in our lives. Because we've received an unearned love, an undeserved love. We give love. What we have been given, we are to give away. God's salvation is displayed in, God's, in response to God's people. Therefore, we love one another in obedience to God. We are able to do that. Look at verse 22. This, this is incredible. Verse 22, that is, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth 
for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. There are three ways that we are called to love there. We are able to love because we have been purified. Purified speaks of a removal of impurities, a removal of defilement. defilement. Again, it's a past completed act. The instant that Jesus Christ came into our life, we were pure before a holy God only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. None of us are perfect. In fact, 1 John tells us, if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. But as far as God's concerned, when he looks at us, he sees a pure people because of the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. As far as God's concerned, he sees us as if we are already in heaven, even though we are a work in progress to make us into the image of his son. We have been purified before Almighty God. Therefore, we have access to God's ability to love each other. We are commanded because not only have we been purified, but we are, to call, we are called to love each other sincerely, sincerely from a pure heart. But, but there are some words we wish weren't in there. This is one of those. Sincerely, it speaks of a love that is unhypocritical, that is unfeigned. It is when I say I love you, I mean it. I say I love you and there's no hidden agenda. I say I love you if, no, it's simply I love you. And I love you because Christ has first loved me. Therefore, I love you as my brother and sister in Christ, as my family in Christ. You are loved by me because I have been loved. And I love sincerely. And I not only just love sincerely, but I love earnestly from my heart. It speaks of intently, properly, fully stretched. Remember, these people are being persecuted. These people are away from their homes. These people are gathered together in a body of believers in modern day Turkey, but away from home. And yet John, Peter says, love each other earnestly because in the love of each other is security. In the love of each other is the ability to keep going. If you stand on your own, you have a better chance of failing than if you're in a group. You see, sin separates. Sin isolates And Satan uses persecution to make us want to get away, make us want to be isolated, make us want to be all by ourselves. And that's why Peter says, you love each other because you need each other desperately to keep being faithful in the midst of this persecution that you are going through. This persecution has given them the chance to see how valuable each other are. Here's what Hebrews tells us that we how we are to respond. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not for forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This was written to a people that were also being persecuted, written to Jewish believers that were being tempted to go back to Judaism because it was too difficult to live for Christ. And and the author of of Hebrews says, hang together, consider one another, Don't, don't stop meeting together, keep stimulating one another to love and to good deeds because you need each other. There were days... Uh, walking into the church to pastor and quite frankly if I could have gotten away with staying in bed I would have ever had one of those days even pastors have days like that and I would walk into the door and there was this one particular lady that would be standing at the door on a regular basis and I would walk in the door and she would say pastor how are you doing today and I would say fine that's the first that's the answer you're supposed to give fine Great, bless, all those kind of things. And then she would say, really? And there were, there were days I would have to say, no, this is not a good day. And she would pray for me. And it was on those days that we saw God's power work in the midst of our people. It was those days that I saw God working in me. See, obedience isn't always pleasant. Obedience isn't always easy. Obedience is possible because we are together. We need each other. We need to encourage one another, to stimulate one another, to keep going. We need that love. In fact, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, not based on what you know, not based on what you can do, but based on your love for one another. 
Now think about who Jesus said that to. The 12 disciples, the original Baptist church, Peter, whose mouth ran before his brain kicked into gear. Peter, who I'm convinced if he were to be transformed today would be driving a Chevy, beat up Chevy truck with a Confederate flag in the back. John and J James and John, you remember what their nickname was? Sons of Thunder. Because they had hot tempers. Boy, they would have been a good, pass, good pair with Peter. Hello. Sons of Thunder. Then you had all these people. Then you had Judas, who was a thief. He was a treasurer of the group, and he was a thief. Turned out de denying that he knew the Lord, uh, betrayed the Lord. And then there's Peter, denied that he knew the Lord. There's, and then Thomas, who's not real sure if he can stand on faith or not. I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole mess that, that are there. Then, then you've got Simon, uh, uh, then you've got one, one of the guys that, that is uh, uh, Simon the Zealot. He's called a zealot because he wants to wipe out anyone related to the Roman government. And then you've got Matthew, who used to work for the Roman government. There is division among these 12 guys, and Jesus looks at them and says, you prove that you are my disciples by loving each other. Do you remember when they come into the upper room to celebrate the, the Last Supper? Do you remember what they were arguing about? Who was the greatest? You can imagine, you can just see, your, you can see Peter's chest like, that. well, it's obviously me. He pulls me aside all the time. I mean, so I've got to be his favorite. They're arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus is, the shadow of the cross is across them. And they're arguing who's the greatest for crying out loud. And yet Jesus' command in his final message to them, you, you guys love each other. Whether you like it or not, you need each other. You prove that you are followers of me by the way you relate to one another. In fact, 1 John tells us that if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar, and the truth isn't in you. Our relationship to each other displays the real character of our relationship with God. How we interact with each other reveals how we really interact with God. We display our salvation by loving one another. Here's the last command, verses, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Thirdly, God's salvation is revealed in our response to God's coming judgment. God's salvation is displayed in our response to God's people. And thirdly, God's salvation is displayed in our response to God's word. Look what he says in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So, therefore, put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Our response to God's word reveals either the presence or the absence of God's salvation. Again, this is a command of urgency. That is, these believers in exile, under persecution, needed to stand on the stand standard outside of themselves so that they weren't determining how to respond on their own desires. They were determining how to respond to the persecution and to each other and to their pastors, to their elders, based on what the Word of God says. Again, this command to crave is the command of urgency. It speaks of, a, it speaks of straining after, desiring greatly. That is, you see it and you go after it. Nothing is going to stop you. Janet and I have a new granddaughter. She's absolutely gorgeous, prettiest girl on the face of the earth. I'm not prejudiced whatsoever. It's just a fact. And so thankful she looks nothing like me whatsoever. So we don't have to have an arranged marriage eventually down the road. <laughs> but you forget how strong uh, those little babies' desires can be. When it's time to eat, it's time to eat. Mom was breastfeeding, but for the time being, she bottle feeds when she's uh, away at work so she can have something to eat at daycare. And so they began to wean her to have a, have a bottle, that thing. And boy, when, when, when Aliyah got a hold of that bottle, it was like, stand back, get out of the way. 
And when they, they had to take the bottle away because she drank it so fast, they had to stop halfway through the bottle and burp her, you know, sorry, just before lunch, burp her so she could continue to eat. And boy, when they stopped that bottle and put the bottle aside, Elias' eyes never left the bottle. It was like, okay, brr, now give it back. You kind of think it. That's what longing for, craving looks like. And God says to these believers in exile, crave for my word like a newborn baby. This, this book that, that um, most of us have 9,000 copies of and 8,999 of them are covered with dust because they just kind of sit there on our uh, shelves we, we show our real desire for God's word uh, by reading it. We show God's desire for his word by doing it. You see, this, this book that, that I hold that we call God's Holy Bible is not just a book of history. It's not just a book of self-help. This is a book written by God so we could know who he is. So that we could glorify him and honor him so we could love him. This book is God's diary to us that he wants us to read. He wants us to know him as much as we can humanly can know an infinite God. But he wants us to know him because, folks, we, we follow and we trust people and things we know. So God is saying to these exiled believers, crave for my word like newborn babies. But there, there's a condition that goes before that can happen. He gives to us in verse 1, so put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. That, that's a precondition that must take place. You see, the craving for God's word is too many times interrupted by present-day reality. He tells, he gives them five actions that they must put aside so they can crave the, the, word, the word of God. They were to put away malice. It means wickedness. It's an all-inclusive term for any action that opposes God. Again, he's writing to exiles. It would have been real easy for them to desire revenge against the Roman government. And, and Peter says, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, put away, put away malice. Secondly, put away guile. Guile speaks of deceit. It's a, it's a fisherman's word. It means to catch with bait. That is, it's lying that occurs to make another person look bad. Put away hypocrisy, that is, put away play acting. It's actions that hide the real person and its motives. It's that are put away envy, a desire for possession or ability of another, so that person possesses the desire, is devalued and hated and even attacked, so you can get what you want. They're to put away malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Speaks of speaking against someone to make them look bad, to run them down, to disparage. And some of these believers that Peter is writing to, no doubt, are struggling with one or all of those things. And when one or all of those things are taking place in our lives, we don't crave the spiritual milk of the word because when we read the holy word of God, the spirit of God convicts us of our sin so we can confess it and so he can forgive it. So whenever we catch ourselves in sin, when we realize we're in sin, we, we run away from the church. We run away from God's word because we don't want to be made, made feel guilty. We, we justify that what we're thinking, what we're doing based on our circumstance. And, and Peter says, don't let your circumstance dictate the way you act. Let the word of God dictate the way you act. Church, in this day and time, in this modern day time, our, our own personal experience is elevated above the holy word of God. When we begin to look at the way God set, set aside what marriage is and what our culture says marriage is and what family is, it's different than what the Word of God says. We've got a choice to make. Will we uh, believe on what the Word of God says or will we take what, this, what the, the culture says we are? When, when God says this is what a man and a woman is, this is what's expected out of a man and a woman, and the culture says, hey, a man and a woman, that's, that doesn't matter. You, you be who you think you need to be. We have the decision to make. Are we going to accept what God has to say or accept what the culture has to say. 
We're in a culture that says, oh, debt's, debt allows you just to get what you want. I mean, as long as you can make the payments, go ahead. And eh, if you can't make the payments, hey, declare bankruptcy and start over. What does the Word of God say? Oh, no man, anything but love that's there. We have a decision to make. Are we going to accept what the Word of God has to say? Or are we going to take what the culture has to say? And ladies and gentlemen, just like the silly story I told, the world is looking for God and they're looking at us. And they find him when they find a people that stand on God's standard rather than our own opinions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say this as nice as I know how to say it. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion in the eyes of God doesn't matter. You've got to decide, is that going to offend me? Is that going to make me mad? Or am I going to stand on what the Word of God has to say? We have to understand because of the reality of the presence of our sin, we are saved by God's grace, that we have to understand that we have a tendency to exalt ourselves and do what I want, regardless of what anyone else says. That's our default. That's how, what we go to when we get squeezed. But God says, this is my Word. Crave my Word. Do what my Word says. In order to do that, there are some things you've got to set aside. You can't let revenge drive you. You can't let self-exaltation self -exaltation drive you. You can't, let, you can't let coveting and guile and slander guide you. Let the Word of God guide you. Because verse 2 tells us why. That is, we are to crave it because so by it you may grow up into salvation. That speaks of a, that longing for the pure spiritual, spiritual milk of the word and that you crave it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We crave the word of God because by it only do we grow up in Christ. By, we crave the word of God because by doing it, we are able to present Christ to a world that desperately needs him. Let me back up in chapter 1. I want you to see this. Here's what Jesus has done for us in verse 19. That is, we have, or verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the your sake who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. We deserved hell. We were sinners. There was nothing good about us whatsoever. We didn't think right. We didn't act right. We didn't do right. We didn't talk right. There was nothing about us whatsoever that pleased God. Nothing whatsoever. But... God in his grace came to this world and the man Jesus was like us yet without sin, died on the cross for us to satisfy the wrath of God and so that we could be ransomed from that futile way of life and we prove that we are connected to him by what we desire. We prove that we're connected to him by how we respond to the fact that our lives will be held accountable. We prove that we are connected to him by our love of other believers and we prove that we're connected to him by our response to the word of God. When people look at you connected to First Baptist Church, will they continue looking for God or will they say, found him? Andrew Brunson is an evangelical Presbyterian missionary in Turkey. He is in the very area of the same people that Peter is writing to. Andrew Brunson has served Turkey, the area of Turkey, for 20 years as a missionary that's there. And there was some government issues going on and there was some folks, some Islamic terrorists that wanted to try to overthrow the, comp the country and they were defeated. And Andrew Brunson was arrested within uh, the net of those things going on. He was accused of being associated with that terrorist group. And he's been in prison for the last 18 months. He, he's in Turkey only because he's telling others about Jesus. And now he's in prison for 18 months on July the 18th this week. He's going to be tried. And unless he's released, 
he'll be facing a 35-year sentence. As a 50-year-old, that will be a life sentence. If you're Andrew Brunson, you're there simply because Jesus sent you there, and now you're in a Turkish jail, separated from your wife and from your family. How do you respond? How do you respond to your Turkish guards? What are you thinking about the Turkish government who has said that they simply want one of their people released from jail, and if one of their people is released from jail, then Andrew will be released from jail. Andrew is simply a political pawn. What do you think about the Turkish government that's there? And what are you thinking about? You're there to tell the Turkish people about Jesus, and now you're in prison. What do we think about those things? Andrew is still going to be held accountable by God. One day, stand before a holy, the holy God. He'll be held accountable. Not because he's in prison, but he's going to be held accountable by how he acted in Jesus' name while he's in prison. He's going to be held accountable for how he loved other inmates that are there in prison that are believers in Christ. He's going to be held accountable for those that are in prison who need to hear about Christ, he's going to be held accountable by, for was he just selfish, or was he just throwing a pity party for himself, or was he sharing Jesus with folks in the Turkey's prison? He's going to be held accountable. He's going to be held accountable for how he lived out the word of God. Whether he has a copy of scripture or not, he's still responsible for living out when Jesus said, you love me more than anything else. You love me with everything you are. He's going to be held accountable for loving those around him. He's going to be held accountable for being a witness for Christ wherever he is, even in the Turkey's prison. And there would be some that say, him, Andrew Brunson, being in a Turkey's prison is not part of God's will. How do you know that? We have many letters in our Bible written from a prisoner. It may very well be that part of God's plan to reach Turkey was to put Andrew Brunson in prison. Because how he acts will say more about Jesus than anything he could do. When Chillicothe, Livingston County looks at us, do they see a people changed by Christ? Followers of Jesus display their salvation by living for the coming judgment with respect for Almighty God. Followers of Jesus prove they are followers of Jesus by their love for each other. Followers of Jesus are hungry for God's word, providing ungodly behaviors are rejected. The presence of ungodly behaviors will produce the absence of the word of God. Therefore, hungering for the word of God is vital for growth. Do you know Christ is your personal savior? Are these commands being followed in your life and some of you they're not being followed because you're yet to be a believer you're yet to be a follower of Jesus today is your day to make the decision to choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ so that he can begin a process in you to show himself to those around you who need him some of you are followers of Jesus you have been for a long time but you're on cruise control and it's time to get back to work it's time to realize that Jesus is coming and you're going to be held accountable and so when God looks at your life what will we think of your obedience? Forgiveness is necessary. Repentance and confession are, are necessary. We live in a world that is becoming more and more anti-God every day. What are we doing with that? What are you doing with that? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please. Mm-hmm.